Good evening, church. Uh, if you haven't got the notes, we email our notes out every week. Um, please be turning to Mark chapter 8, verse 13. So uh, if you're sitting next to a friend and you haven't got them, they can email them too very, very quickly. Uh, we're doing a series on the life of Jesus, yep. and uh, so we're picking up from where we left on on Wednesday, uh, and the title of today's sermon is, I've decided to follow Jesus, but what does that really mean? <laughs> Come on. Come on. In this section, as we study out the ministry of Jesus, he makes it really clear to his disciples exactly what that means, because they were a little slow. <laughs> In Mark chapter 8, verse 13, it says, Then he left them, got into the boat, and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed with one another and said, Is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes that fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke up the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Here you see what's going on between Jesus and his disciples. He's Jesus like, man, I'm really teaching you very clearly here. Don't you get it? Mm. You know, he'd left the Pharisees and gone to the region of Magdon. He teaches the disciples in the boat that they've got hard hearts. They're not getting it. They were slow to understand. He'd fed the 5,000 and they'd ended up with more than they'd started with. They'd all got a big basket of food to go and take home, a bit like after our Bible talk, you know, that we send people off with, you know, containers of food. Yeah. And then he feeds the 4,000 to teach them again. Mm. And he gives one basket to every individual apostle to make sure that they really understand it. You know, he's trying to teach them that with God, you can do anything. Yeah. Yeah. With God, you can do absolutely anything. In this case, with Jesus, all things are possible. Mm. Point number one, Jesus shows them what he means. There is a big difference between telling somebody what is right and then showing them. Because we all know that sometimes you can have something explained to you and you go, I just don't get it. Yeah. So we actually need to be shown things sometimes. Yeah. And we pick up in Mark 8, 22. It said, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go and tell anyone in the village. As we'll find out, this is a physical parable to his disciples of what he has just tried to teach them. We see a familiar pattern in Jesus' miracles and his teaching. He constantly uses repetition to teach people. Why? because people don't get it first time. It doesn't matter whether it's in business or in sport, we do that. We go, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Jesus' teaching is all like. Sometimes when we read the Bible, we go, well, I'm just studying this parable, and we don't actually take it into context. We actually don't see, like, I know one brother said to me, I thought the feeding the 5,000, the feeding the 4,000 were the same thing, but they just got the numbers wrong. No, 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 this was like Jesus doing it twice. And it's funny that with the 5,000, 4,000 was less, so you would have thought they would thought, you know, it's easier to feed the 4,000. Yeah. But we see a consistent teaching pattern. Mm. First, bring your problems to Jesus. That's what we should do, you know, we've got to stop trying to figure our own life out. You know when you get frustrated and you feel challenged and depressed, you know why? It's because you are trying to figure your life out. Right. 
That's why the world has so many, has so much depression and just so many, it's like, well, you're trying to do what only God can do. And that's why man is so unhappy. You know, it is an incredible thing and privilege to lead a church. But I love it because really I don't feel that much pressure because it's God's church. And if there's a problem in God's church, then he better figure it out because <laughs> it's his church. Otherwise, it's not his church. If it's my church, well, I'm doomed. So are you. I mean, I mean like, it's like, what am I? I know. Ask my wife and kids. It's like I was having breakfast with them this morning. He goes, Dad, the church sees you like this, like, you know, this and that. We go, we see you totally different. We see this old man jumping around after tanks and risk boards and, you know, like this. Like, that's the real me at home. Thank goodness we've got God. Secondly, we see that Jesus blesses humility. He answers the calls of those that beg him. You know, too often the reason things don't happen in our life, we go, God, can you do this? He goes, I don't even know if you want that. But we see a constant pattern that Jesus responds to people that are desperate spiritually. We see an intimate Jesus. We see this because he takes this man by the hand, leads him outside the village... And he shows that he cares for him personally and gives him individual attention. One of the most mind-blowing facts about God is that he can focus totally on Pete and Pete's issues and totally on Jenna and totally on Sean and totally on Emma all at the same time with total focus. I'm so glad that I worship an omnipresent God He is everywhere at all times with intentional focus on every individual. That's mind-blowing. You know, we run to men or women to help us that are distracted at best and can only give us some of our time. When we try and get our needs met by other human beings, we are always going to fail. I'm so glad that God is in control. He also gives people spiritual vision. You know, when people don't have a dream for their life, it gets boring and depressing. I mean, let's be honest, you go, what, what are you going to do today? I'll play video games for 14 hours. Great, you're going to enjoy that? I mean, most people actually don't live an adventurous life. They don't plan great things for their life. But here he takes this man, and after spitting on the man's eyes and taking his hands, this signifies to this man, you are going to see incredible things. You are going to do incredible things. And by touching them, he's saying to him, look, I want your eyes to see God. And by touching his hands, he's going, you no longer are going to use these hands to beg. You're going to use these hands to do the Lord's work. And he's signifying a real change, just like when Paul was converted. You know, the three days of darkness to make him understand, you were wrong. Jesus does a lot of practical things, you know, and he was then going to use his hands to pray and beg for other people. His life of begging was going to be over, but his life of spiritual begging was just beginning. And yet, in this whole interaction, obedience was expected. Jesus constantly gives people a test of obedience. And one of the things that he often goes, he goes, do not go back to your village and tell anyone. Do you know how hard that would have been? I mean, wouldn't you want to go back to your village and say, hey, I can see. I can see. Jesus goes, you know what? You need to be in control of your emotions and your desires. Jesus expects us to be obedient. Often, Jesus doesn't reward us or help us because we've done anything righteous, but he rewards us and then expects obedience. You know, in Romans 2 verse 4, it says, Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? This is like it when we became Christians. I mean, really, how obedient were we before we became Christians? Most of us repented and then got baptized the next day. So we were basically obedient for like 24 hours or so. And he blesses us with forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. But then he expects us to be obedient. 
He expects us to be the example. We're ambassadors for Christ. Yeah. People look at us and go, you should remind me of Jesus Christ. Amen. So when we don't, it makes him sad. He went, man, I gave you blessing. Can you remember that time when you, you were able to forgive your parents that you were bitter against for 10 years? Can you remember when, you know, you're actually no longer addicted to smoking? Now I expect you to act with gratitude. Come on. Yeah. But here we see there's one difference in this miracle to all other miracles. Jesus takes two times to heal the man. Shock horror. Has he lost his power? Is it fading away? Maybe he's not really God, he's just a good bloke. No, this is a physical parable of what has just happened. You see, he's had to do two miracles of feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 and they still don't get it. So he's pulling this man in front of the disciples and going, you know what? Sometimes it takes two times for people to get it. It's a physical parable in front of them. I think about us sometimes. Sometimes it takes us a long time to get things. He was trying to tell them, look, first of all, you can feed 4,000, uh, 5,000 and 4,000 people. What was he going on? Why was that an important? Why didn't Jesus had to feed people? Well, if you think just before Jesus went up to heaven, what is it that he said to Peter? Feed my sheep. He started to first teach them that they could feed the masses physically. But here he's now going, I want you to understand it is going to be your role to feed the masses spiritually. He wanted them to remember though, if it took them so long to get it, the people that they were going to teach, it was going to take them a long time to get it. You know, as Kerry and I talk about members of the church, we want people to grow, and it is really encouraging. I feel like Scotty's got this whole swing thing going, and he's singing. I'm just sitting there to um, with Kerry going, man, I just, I'm so fired about the way they grow. And I saw Dean uh, and, uh, you know, Sean coming in, and I remember our early days in the London church. We were playing jokes on each other. There was this camaraderie against the young interns and evangelists. And I went, it's coming now. I can see it. There's this banter going back and forward. And it's so encouraging. But sometimes we're a little bit slow on the uptake. I think sometimes we feel like God doesn't believe in me. You ever feel like that? Well, God just doesn't want me to be fruitful. That's crazy sometimes. But we can get our mind into that. We can go, well, I don't know if God wants me to lead. And then you have a baptism in your ministry and then another one. And God's like, what else can I do? Right, come on. You know, you can know everything about the ministry. But the ministry only moves if God wants it to. That's right. The mark of somebody who is chosen is that God works through them. It's not that they know the Bible. It's not that they know how to implement it. It's whether God bears fruit in their ministry, because that is something that only God can do. And sometimes he'll take somebody who goes, I don't know if I can do it, like Gideon. And he goes, well, I'm going to give you somebody that becomes a Christian in your ministry, another person becomes a Christian ministry, another person becomes a Christian ministry, and goes, I don't know what else I can do. You well, I don't feel adequate. All of us are inadequate. Right. All of us are inadequate. You know, I think about learning to take advice. God wants us to continually get advice. So what he allows us to do is he allows us to continually fail. Why is my life not going well? Well, did you get any advice on that? No, I thought I knew what I was doing. That's the problem. And he will allow us to fail again and again and again. You know, God can do anything. I think about even on the three short years, some of the great victories, I was just thinking about some of the great victories that he was trying to get these guys to really understand. I remember when Jeremy and Roz moved here. And they, Jeremy was sad because his parents had left God and everything. And we just thought, you know, it'd be great, you know, if we could sort of maybe pull them back. And we started just Skyping them and studying the Bible with them. They're not like this, this senior couple in the Gainesville church, baking for everybody and evangelizing people on Sydney Uni on Facebook. And that's an incredible, I mean, to think that you can help convert somebody and you don't even live in the same country or city. 
So often we think it depends on us. Right. It doesn't depend on us. You know, I think about some of the parents that if I said to you, your parents would come out to church, you'd be like, no way. The great victory of Tim's father coming out. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, just the friendship I have with him. And, you know, during the uh, men's day, he was telling everybody, you, you need your child to come to this church. The minister's good. He, he changes your kids. It's like, like this. You know, and I've been in touch with David's mum a couple of times and really and she promised to come here and if you're listening next week um, but you know really working with different parents to really help them come I thought Effie's mum was here last week and the week before and she's here again yeah. I'm sure if uh, uh, one of uh, Effie's early said I said your mum would come she'd be like that no, was her and yet God is rewarding yeah you know, I think about, I was listening to a, a, an old tape, like 20 years ago. I know, before you were born, most of you. Okay. <laughs> How the church used to run is the sermons would be recorded on a tape. That's one of those things that goes round and round, okay. And they would have a machine at the back where they'd take the master, and basically, during the fellowship, they would make billions of copies, and then you'd buy them afterwards. And it was one of me in 1994. I was, it was me preaching going, I believe I can get married. I have faith I can get married. Like some of you singles pray. Okay, like that. But it was like, and I'm listening to this guy going, but I'm married. And it's amazing just listening to yourself in the past. I think about how work, uh, God has worked in Dom's life. Dom was in Germany praying, I want to become a minister. Wow. So he moves to Sydney and joins a false church that he didn't realize to train to be a minister and goes, this is not it. Mm. And yet Pete on Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve? Christmas Eve. I mean, if there was ever a night that you wouldn't evangelize, right, because you're self-focused with presents, it'd be Christmas Eve. But Pete meets him, invites him to church, he studies becomes a Christian, is now in the ministry and will be leading the North sector when she leaves. I think about Leslie. Now, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pick on Leslie. Okay. Leslie is one of the twin boas. Okay. Now, first of all, it was a very special baptism. I don't think we've cried so much. And Lennox, the older brother, baptizing her with Kira, and they're great friends. And you know, it's amazing how God changed people. I said, you know, that Leslie's pretty awesome, Jenna. Yeah, he said, she ought to think about going to the ministry. Oh, she's talking about it now. She doesn't want anybody to know, but she's talking about it now. <laughs> It's amazing how God can change people's hearts. You know, I think this earlier this year I talked about really dreaming big. And one of my dreams as in studying this all out was to be able to go to Jerusalem. And now I've been able to buy a ticket to Jerusalem. My parents uh, offered to help pay for it for my birthday and etc. And I'm like, I'm going to spend a week in Jerusalem. I'm just going to spend New Year's Eve with Kerry in Jerusalem. I'm like, if you don't aim for anything, you get nothing. And just to fully embarrass myself, um, I was sharing with my mum, I called her the other day in England, if I'm English if you hadn't guessed, and she said, Joe, I've got to share with you. She said, I was asked to speak at a women's uh, meeting. They live in a small village in England. And I shared your testimony, Joe. And I've emailed it to you. I said, okay. She said, it said, just about the prayer, power of prayer in God. And so I got it. And this is what she said. <laughs> a long time ago now, I was in the village shop on New Street. I was in the back room where the printing machine is now. There were two ladies in the shop. And then my son came in with his punk haircut, earrings in his hair, his denim jacket with a skull drawn on the back, with chains hanging down, torn jeans, Dr. Martin boots. You get the picture. <laughs> At that time, it was known that drugs were being sold and used by our young people in the pub car park, and the lads hung around the bus shelter or up the playing field to get up to no good. Anyway, <laughs> Joe bought what he came into the shop for and left. The two men went up to the counter in a conversation with Phyllis Mills said, how can his mother let him go around like that? <laughs> and the conversation went on until I appeared from the back room. <laughs> then we went to see his tutor at college. 
When we went to visit, he asked if we were really Joe's parents. You look so normal. <laughs> when we were faced with life's challenges, do we trust and believe Jesus can answer our prayers? I decided to pray the prayers of St. Paul in Ephesus, chapter 1. I pray that the eyes of Joe's heart would be enlightened in order that he might now uh, have Jesus as his saviour. Three years later, while in London, he became a Christian. He is 50 this year, and his wife are ministers in the church in Australia. You know, if he can change me, <laughs> he can change you. You know, this is a physical illustration to these people. So often, if not all the time, we need physical illustrations. That's why when we study with the people, we can say, you need to pray, but we need to take them praying. Yeah. Yeah, you need to evangelize, but we need to take them evangelizing. We even need to have Bible studies with them and go, this is how you read the Bible. That's why Jesus said, come follow me. You will never become a Christian until you free up your time to live like a Christian. Come on. It's not an intellectual thing. Right. You've actually got to go, okay, what do you do? So I was sharing with a, a guy we were studying with yesterday. I said, well, typically, uh, some like Dean or Scotty, they get up early in the morning and they pray for half an hour, read the Bible for half an hour. And I suggest that, you know, you do that on your own one day and then maybe Dean prays with you Tuesday and do it on your own Wednesday and Scotty prays with you Thursday so you can learn. Then we all meet up on campus most days to evangelize at six o'clock because it's when everybody comes out of campus. And then we can really teach you how to evangelize. And then we come to church and then we get into Bible studies. In other words, we've got to make people disciples, not just tell them what a disciple does. Yeah. That is the difference between our churches and all the others. We do it, not just say it. Come on. Are you with me, church? Yeah. Point two. Jesus lays out the future reality in Matthew 16 verse 13 Matthew 16 verse 13 so as I'm studying out the the chronological life of Jesus it does go between different um, Gospels which is really really first of all it's really challenging because I'm having to put this in there and then he goes okay well it says it goes there and I'm trying to figure out where all the parables go and that's a bit of a guesswork in some ways but here he then goes on it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? This is Matthew 16, 13. They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Let me just stop here. Most people think Jesus was a wet sissy that talked about grace all the time. Come on. When he asked them who he was like, they said, John the Baptist, you know, the guy that just ate handfuls of grasshoppers. <laughs> Elijah, that wild man, Jeremiah. That's who people saw Jesus at. Right. He was a scary individual if you didn't want to be righteous. Come on. And sometimes a scary individual when you did want to be righteous. <laughs> he goes on and says, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Wherever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed on heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Wow. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be if someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? 
What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come into his hands, Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming. Jesus now goes up to this place called Caesarea Philippi. And if you've got the notes, there's a map there. And it was basically an ancient Roman city located on the southwestern base of Mount Hermon. Adjacent to the city, and this is where it gets important, was a spring and a grotto which basically had a shrine dedicated to the Greek god of Pan. So it's basically a cliff face with these temples put into it. Now, Kerry and I have been there. The god Pan was the god that had goat feet and horns. Now, if you've ever seen Lion, Witch and Wardrobe, that, okay, that's actually where we get the concept of horns on the devil, from that. Okay, so that's what it was renowned for. Jesus asked his disciples who he thought he really was. Most of them thought of him as this radical guy. He was a confrontational man. It is amazing how many people we have that come and study the Bible here and all we do is preach the gospel. It's funny, if anybody's challenged me this year on I'm preaching wrongly, I mean, it's all Jesus. That's all we're doing is chronological Jesus. It's not like I'm coming up putting a you know, scripture from this bit and a scripture. This is just the life of Jesus. Yeah. And it's convincing me just how much more hardline Jesus was. Come on. But some people come and they go, nah, you're too hard, you don't preach grace enough. Every human being is saved by grace because otherwise the alternative is perfection. But Jesus came to save the world. And you don't do that by man be pambing around, praying and not getting out there and doing anything. Come on. Come on, Joe. Yeah. You don't get out there, and as Jesus put it, by giving up everything. Right. That's the truth. Come on. It's really like swimming. You know, at the Olympics, they actually try and figure out how little of a budgie smuggler, sort of swimmer, they can wear to get through the water. They're going, I need to basically not be rude, but basically get in this pool with nothing on so that I can go as fast as possible and win a medal. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get rid of everything to get really slipstream and go, how can I be the most effective I can for Christ? And if it hinders me, let's just get rid of it. You know, Peter, rather than saying he's like a prophet, he declares, and he's the first to declare, you are the Messiah. In that moment, Jesus had found the leader of the movement. He was the first to get the truth. You know, God had to reveal to Jesus who he should choose. And in that moment, he said, I know God revealed this to you. And as a result, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. And when we do the kingdom study, we know that Peter preaches in Acts 2, which is the opening of the kingdom. Jesus then says he will build the church on the rock. This is where the Catholics twist it. Catholics say, well, the rock is Peter. You can't build a church on any human being. Because we're imperfect. The rock he's actually talking about is what he just said. You are going to build the church on the fact that Jesus is God. That is the cornerstone. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, does everybody know what a cornerstone is? The cornerstone basically is the stone that if you take it out from the corner of the house, the whole house falls down. That's the point of all pressure. And in uh, Ephesians 2, 19, it says, Consequently, we are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles, prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. The church is built on the fact that Jesus is God. If Jesus is not God, then the Messiah and our whole faith falls down. But then he says... The gates of Hades will not overcome. What is he saying there? Well, he's actually standing in front of the temple of Pan. He's gone up there 
And I remember doing a devotional there, I don't know, 15 years ago. And this is what it looks like now. Okay, so it's just this cave behind. And he's basically saying, disciples, the gates of Hades, they're an actual cave. Okay, that's what the gates, that's what they were known as. And they're still known as that today. And he's going, you see that world, that false religion? He goes, you don't need to worry about false religion. That is not going to take us down. You know, there are so many stupid ideas in false religion. In this one, basically what would happen is you go and pay your, your money or whatever to the priest and they'd cut up a sacrifice and they'd throw it in the cave. And if the blood ran out the back and down into the Jordan, then you would be blessed. But if you think about that, basically if you gave them a lot of money, they'd really throw it hard. And they'd go to the back of the cave and of course the blood would run out. But if you only gave them a dollar, you'd be like, ah, oh, sorry bro, maybe if you give us more money. Yeah. Like all false religions. It's about people getting money, not sacrificing money. Here also we see the term for the first time, kingdom and church, interchange. Yeah. Why is that? Well, the Jews absolutely were waiting for the kingdom of Israel. But why did God change it and not call it the kingdom continually all the way through to Revelation? Well, unfortunately, the kingdom had a view of a violent kingdom. So we use this word church, which comes from the Greek, which means to be called out. So we're a called out people from the world. So we are meant to look nothing like the world. Too many churches want to be relatable. They want to have the music and this. The most important thing at church is the message. Yes. It's the gospel. Yep. That's it. It's not actually physical worship. Although that's good, that's actually for us, singing to one another. God says in the New Covenant, the way we worship Him is by living a sacrificial life. Amen. You know, from that time on, Jesus then went and told them, guys, our life is not going to be about the world. It's not going to be health, wealth, and prosperity. Basically, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be treated really badly. I'm going to have a life of suffering, and then they're going to kill me. And then the future leader of the movement, Peter, takes him aside and goes, uh-uh, no way, you have it wrong, Jesus. And right here, we see the difference between religion and true Christianity. Jesus says, following me is a life of personal sacrifice with the reward of heaven. Religion is where God, you think God helps you to achieve the dreams you want. This is the difference. And Jesus, rather than doing anything, he takes this moment and he really rebukes Peter. He goes, you know what? You're even an instrument of Satan. You are tempting me now with the concept that I can be the Messiah without sacrifice. Wow. Wow. That's the difference. If you're going to follow Christ, it's a life of sacrifice. It's a life of tears, a life of fasting, a life of prayer, where you give up your life to save as many as possible. The older I get, the more I'm convinced, the more I study heaven, and I'm like, you know what? That's the only reward you're expecting to get. And you know what? It is the most incredible reward. You know, we have to choose, like Peter, the world or the kingdom. See, why did Peter rebuke him? Well, Peter wasn't stupid. I mean, he just figured out this is the Messiah. So I've got to follow him now. And if Jesus, if that's the life you're going to live, I'm not an idiot. If I lead the movement and you die, that's the life I'm going to live. And I don't like that. That's what he was saying. Tell me if we don't all feel like that sometimes in our heart. Yeah. When's the pain going to go away, God? When you die. That's it. When am I going to stop struggling? When you die. When are all my dreams going to come true? When you die. When am I going to be at peace with everybody that's annoying me? When you die. <laughs> when am I no longer going to have to go out in the street and evangelize and try and convert some of these obstinate, rude people? When you die. 
That's it. Come on, Joel. You know, the concerns of the world are self, money, family, popularity, comfort, possessions. The concerns of God are saving people from self, money, popularity, comfort, and possessions. Our whole goal is to seek and save the lost. That's it. You know, I'm so inspired. I think Dean, I sent Dean's message last week to everybody. The world said, everybody I could, I sent it to. I turned Chi and I was interested to talk to Chi. I said, Chi, you know, because Chi's leading the Hong Kong team and Dean's the right hand guy. I was like, Chi, what do you think? <laughs> he goes, I'll be honest. Best sermon I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. I didn't go, what about me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Because it was. I was weeping with tears, convicted. I was convicted by his lifestyle. Yeah. But you see, when you change your life, and Dean shared the struggle, Dean said, I'm going to uh, you know, give $10,000 for the Hong Kong mission team. Do you know what that did this week? Everybody else went, me too. Yeah. Got Chittera said, I'll do 7000 Aaron said, I'll do 10000 Other people, I'll give 5000 You see, when you personally sacrifice... It inspires others. And I'm incredibly inspired by what one man can do. I think there are so many people that are willing to give once you start to get bold. I know many of us have given already this week. And we've got to open up our minds at what God can do. People are actually looking to sacrifice. It's funny, when people are dead, I've been speaking to two guys, one that used to be in the Fiji church is now in New Zealand, a guy that leads a, a small traditional church down in Melbourne. These guys are like, they don't know, they're not part of a worldwide movement. They don't know what to do with their money. So they don't ask their congregation for money. Because they've got nowhere to give it. The venue costs a couple of hundred bucks, none of them are employed, so they go, well, it costs about 300 bucks to run the church every month. They're like, yeah, I need to give it to missions. Good idea. Fantastic. You know, your choice is to live wholeheartedly for Christ in a life of sacrifice. Or just give in the world. You know what the world tastes like? It's empty. Tastes nice for a moment. It's like a McDonald's, you know? Like, really nice, and you go, you, what was that? <laughs> I mean, you do, you just sort of go, you know, look so nice, you're like, <laughs> you really do. You know, and then he says, some of you here will see the kingdom. One of the problems we're living in the West is everybody in this room genuinely believes that they will live to 60. I don't know any of you in this room who go, I don't think I'm going to live to 60. And that's a real problem. He said, you know, some of you are going to die before the kingdom comes. And he was talking about Judas. Too many of us think, I won't change today because I will live tomorrow. You know, even last month we had three brothers and sisters die in Chicago. They've gone to heaven. They've achieved their goal. Nothing to be sad about. I mean, the sadness is left with those that are left. I think about, you know, when have I been the most effective? Well, actually, we led a small church in, in Brisbane, and we had one of the sisters, Brenda, die. Mm. Actually, more successful technically in Brisbane than I have been here. Because I have not, no Christians that we've converted die. And the goal is to get to heaven, right? Yeah. I think too many of us think that we're going to live forever. Yeah. My son was telling me about Sia. You know the singer Sia? And I don't know much about her life. He was telling me this morning, he said, she has quite a rough life. She's from Adelaide. She was on the pavement with her boyfriend. He walked out in the road and got hit by a truck. Dead. That can happen to anybody. If you knew you were going to die in seven days, what would you do spiritually? Whatever it is, ye knew to do it today. Because then you, if you think that's what I'm going to do in seven days, you know that that's right. And God has given you life, but he can take it away. You know, in conclusion, I've decided to follow Jesus, but what does that really mean? Shows people physically what they must do. 
That's why as disciples we need to spend so much time pouring our lives into the non-Christians and the young Christians. And sometimes us older Christians when we get weak. Amen? Amen. You know, a good disciple gets lots of physical time with their mentor and their discipler. Too often we go, I know what to do. Do you really? It's amazing training these great young men like Sean and Chi and Dean. I, I feel like I sit in their studies I go, no, you haven't quite got it, have you? We had a conversation about this this week. It takes time to really train people. Sean knows exactly the same scriptures I do in studying the Bible with people. But I've got 20 odd more years experience to him. You need to be with other disciples all the time. That's what it means to have a disciple's heart, to continually learn. And point two, Jesus lays out the future reality. Pleasure in this world and hell in the next, or sacrifice in this world and heaven in the next. You know, it is always inspiring. One of the things I get, it's very inspiring to have Michelle get baptized, she's already there, amen. I don't mean to favor one against the other, but James is getting baptized today and he's blind. If it's one thing that marks the kingdom of God, is that it attracts the talented and powerful that want to do something with their life, and it attracts the poor, disheveled, and disabled because it is a mark that we love people. Yeah. It's a mark, that we, and most of our ministries are built on the campus, and James is a student. But we need both to be a true church of God. That's why we're helping all the poor this Saturday. By the way, on Friday, it's the uh, fasting day of mercy, and I'll, I'll deal with that uh, on Wednesday. But I'll leave you with the uh, words of the song for these two. I have decided to follow Jesus. It simply goes, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though I may wander, I will still follow. Though I may wander, I still will follow. And though I wander, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world way, way behind me, and the cross ever before me. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though no one goes with me, still I will follow. If I'm the only one, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide to follow Jesus? Will you decide to follow Jesus? No turning back, no turning back. Amen.